Hello and welcome back. In the previous lecture you learned how to rotate entities in a frame using the rotation component and how to determine the rotation direction using the right hand rule and in this lecture we are going to have a look at the scale component that you can use to stretch or shrink an entity. And it might sound as an obvious concept and an easy action to perform. Indeed if I attach the scale component to the yellow circle and specify its default values of 1 this time for the x, y and z axis. It is quite straightforward that if you want to double its size, all you have to do is change its x and y axis values to 2. But even though by now you should be able to visualize in your mind how this type of transformation would happen along the three axes in a frame, sometimes scaling 3D objects in the right direction can be tricky and I'll give you a few examples for this here in our scene. I'm going to start with the cylinder. So I attach the scale component to it and set its default values for the three axes. And then let's say that I'd like to make the cylinder larger. So I change the X axis value to two, but the result is not what we expect to happen if we just focus on the scale component itself. The same way, if I wanted to make the cylinder taller, in normal conditions I should change the y-axis value to 2. But again, this is not what we are getting. So I'll undo the transformation. And the reason why this is happening is because we previously applied another transformation to the cylinder. First, we changed the rotation around the z-axis. So if you apply the right-hand rule, pointing your thumb finger towards you, we rotated the cylinder counterclockwise, which means that its x axis and y axis rotated counterclockwise by 90 degrees. And now its x axis has the same direction of the world space y axis. And its y axis has the same direction of the world space x axis. And then we apply the negative rotation around the world space y axis. So now point your finger down to see the rotation direction and therefore the new position of the cylinder's y-axis rotated clockwise by 90 degrees and now is in the same direction of the workspace z-axis. I understand that for someone this can sound tricky and abstract so for this reason I created an animation for you to better understand. So this is the starting point of our cylinder and the original position of its axis. When we first applied the rotation around the z-axis, this is what happened. So both the x and y-axis rotated counterclockwise and moved to their new position. And then we applied the negative rotation around the workspace y-axis and we had a clockwise rotation. So the cylinder's y-axis moved to the workspace z-axis position. Which means that now, if we want to scale the cylinder along the world space of y-axis to turn it into a taller cylinder, now we need to change the x-axis value of its scale component. Therefore, if I go back to the live preview and change this value from 1 to 2, we are now getting the expected result. The same way, if we want to transform our cylinder and make it larger to double its size equally, now we need to change its z-axis value in the scale component to scale the object along the workspace x-axis. So going back to the live preview, when I change the z-axis value to 2, we get the expected result again. And to do this, we didn't have to change the x and y-axis values, but the values of the x and z-axis. And finally, if you want to transform the cylinder in kind of a longer tunnel, obviously the only value left to change is the one of the y-axis. Indeed, if I go back to the reference animation, you can see that to scale the object along the world space z-axis, you actually need to change the y-axis value in the scale component. So I go back to the live preview, and if I now change this from 1 to 2, you can see that this is exactly the end result that we wanted to achieve. I'll reload the page and move back a bit to show the cylinder's borders. And now let's talk about a relative scale. Therefore, as you already know, if I attach the scale component to our box, all the changes that I'm going to apply to it will be inherited by its child entity. 
So if I scale the green panel, the gray circle will inherit the same transformation from its parent. Now, since we rotated the box around the x-axis by 90 degrees, you know that something unexpected is going to happen when I change these values. I'm going back to the animation that we used previously. Just let me reset the axis position for you. And now we have the starting position for our box. And this is what we did. We rotated the box by 90 degrees around the x-axis, therefore the cylinder's y-axis is now in the same direction of the world space as z-axis, and the z-axis in the same direction of the world space y-axis. So what can you understand from this? That if you want to scale both the entities along the world space y-axis, you actually need to change the parent's z-axis value in the scale component. So let's go back to live preview and try this out from 1 to 2, and this is exactly the resulting effect. I'm going back to the reference animation again. Now, since nothing has changed for the x-axis, if you want to scale both the entities up along its direction, you can and still have to refer to the x-axis in the scale component to do that. I'm going back to the live preview, and when I change this value from 1 to 2, you can see that both the box and the gray circle behave the same way the yellow circle did when we applied this transformation along the worst space x-axis. What happens when we shrink entities? Well, obviously the result is something quite intuitive as long as we use a positive value. But what happens to the 3D objects if we keep decreasing a scale value? To show you this, I'm setting the x-axis value back to 1, then I'll start with 0.5 and keep decreasing its value to minus 0.5 and finally to minus 1. Since the two circles are overlapping, I'll move the yellow circle behind the gray one, increasing the negative value of the z-axis in the position component. And so this is called reflection and is what you get with 3D objects when you use negative values in the scale component. I'll move closer as something visually interesting is going on here. If you look at the green panel, it seems that we are looking inside a shoe box, and we can also see the gray circle inside it. And the yellow circle is overlapping with this phase of the box the same way it did at a certain point during lecture 5, where you learned about positioning. And again, something interesting is happening to these two phases of the box that are kind of transparent. And if we move to the other side, now these two faces are transparent and we can see the other two that we couldn't see from there. So this is happening because our box has been turned inside out like a socket. And from this, just like when we could see the gray circle only from one side, you can now also further understand and appreciate the side HTML attribute. That if I now add to the box, and set its value to double, brings our box back to its normal appearance. And if we move to the other side, you can see that now the face of the yellow circle that has the side HTML attribute set to double as well, is overlapping with this face of our box. So reflection is something quite peculiar, and you may ask yourself, uh, why should I use it? Well, there are several situations where you could use reflection. For example, if you want to create some 3 p animations or other applications of reflection enable you to design 3D objects with specific behavior to achieve useful visual effects for your custom scenes. And this is something we are going to have a look at in the next lecture. So this is how you can scale entities in the 3D space in a frame using the scale component, including all the consequences that may come from using it in combination with the rotation component. With this lecture we have now covered all the possible transformations that you can apply to entities and I'll see you in the next lecture.